But uh, I want to wish you another good morning to everyone here this morning, and uh, good morning to those of you tuning in online, uh, both here and also uh, with Grace Abroad as well. What a special blessing it is to, through our technology, through what the Lord has provided, uh, not just to be here in person, but to um, be able to gather virtually as well. And like I said earlier, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord to worship Him? That's right, it is, it is indeed. And uh, next week, uh, Pastor Aaron will be back from vacation, bringing us a new series of messages. Uh, He knows what they are, but uh, for you, to be determined. Um, But uh, I know he's excited about uh, the next series we have coming. It'll be a great blessing. And uh, so you'll you'll just have to come next week to see what it is. So 100% church attendance, we're going to have it next week to, to see this new series. But Um, I know he and Shannon appreciate all of your prayers for his vacation and for all the love and all the care that you show and for what just a great blessing this church body is. You are, um, we're blessed immensely by all of you and and we're so thankful. Uh, He'll be returning to the office this week, so all the phone calls can uh, recommence on Tuesday. Uh, I'm just kidding, Um, but it'll be good to be together again. Uh, last week, we looked at Colossians 1, uh, 15 through 20, and we saw that the Lord Jesus is above all else. And to show that, we looked at the connection that Jesus has to the Father, to creation, he is Lord over it all, and his authority and how he is Lord over the church. And this week, I hope that you've had intentional times of reflecting on, is this evident in your life? Do, does your life display the truth that Jesus is above all? Do you truly live as if he is supreme in your life? And, and if you ask the closest people to you, ask the person next to you, do you see Jesus as Lord of my life? Okay, no, don't, 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 don't do that. We don't want to. Um, but seriously, would they say that this is true? Would those who know you best say that, yes, this person places Jesus as above all? Jesus is supreme in my brother or in my sister's life. And then does the evidence of Jesus' supremacy in your life result in a love and a hunger for his word? I think many here would attest to this truth, but the more that you are in his word, the greater the desire to want more of it, amen? I mean, when you read his word, it's like, I can't get enough. Like, if you're doing Built by Grace, I don't know if this happens to any of you, but like, you go through one day of Built by Grace, it's like, I can't just stop there. I gotta read on. Like, I know what happens next, but I still want to read on. I want, to, I want to read it again. That's what it looks like to have a true hunger for the Word. I mean, if you're hungry and you're starving for a meal, and it's like, just that one portion just doesn't do it. Like, I want more. You want more. You want more. You want to feed. You um, want to have that true hunger. And, and so that's a brief overview of last week. And this morning, we're going to continue on in Colossians by going to the very next set of verses in chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, Colossians 1, beginning of verse 21, is where we'll be at. But before we begin, a, a little story. Maybe some of you are familiar with Nicky Cruz. His name was made known from the book The Cross and the Switchblade. Cruz had a violent and disturbed upbringing, so much that his mother, um, hopefully nobody here had this nickname, but his mother called him the Son of Satan. As he grew up, he became a member of a New York street gang, and within several months, he became president of this gang. He actually rose to a leadership role very quickly, which kind of goes to show you the, the wickedness and depravity and how deeply entrenched he was in gang activity. Once upon a time, one day, a street evangelist came to share the gospel with him and with the gang, and, and Cruz responded by slapping him and threatening to kill him. And then had the same response when he was presented with the gospel a second time. Hostile. But, and don't you love what's coming, the street evangelist organized a meeting that was intent on converting some of these gang members. So they had this meeting, an evangelism meeting. Everyone's invited, come to the service. We're right here on the streets of New York. Nikki came to the meeting. He prayed to receive Christ. He surrendered all of his weapons to the police. And guess what? He became an evangelist himself. The rest of his life would be spent winning the souls of gang members to Christ, including the very next gang president that followed him. Transformation. So you go from hostility to the gospel to being transformed by it. 
That's a real world example, but the fact of the matter is it represents a greater truth spiritually. We were all at one point hostile to God in our thoughts, in our hearts, and in our actions. See, that's our story, or, or it was our story. Some may be sitting here today or tuning in, and that still may be your story. This morning, as we go through our passage, the glorious truth is that one of two things is true, and we all fall into one of these two camps. Because of Jesus, that was you, but it is no longer. Or because of Jesus, it does not have to be your story any longer. You do not have to be an enemy to him. You do not have to be hostile to him. You can be transformed. As we get set this morning, as we get set to begin, let's just go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the great privilege and the great blessing it is to be in your word, the great blessing it is to be here to worship you, Lord, the great blessing it is to serve you and and to leave here today and to be able to proclaim your name to a lost and dying world, a world that is hostile to you, Lord. Lord, a dying world that is your enemy, apart from the life-changing truth that you, of the gospel, Lord, and of accepting and believing the gospel. So as we go through your word this morning, I pray that we give you praise for what you've done, Lord, but also that it motivates and encourages us to go out and to do something about the truth of your word, to make that evident in our lives. Lord, we ask, again, just for blessing over our time this morning, and we ask all of this in your great, holy, and great name. Amen. All right, Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So remember now, these verses, this comes on the heels of last week talking about the supremacy of Christ, right? Paul launches in, talks about how great Jesus is, how he's above all, and that particular message comes as a result of false teaching that was evident in that area, in that church, that false teachers came in trying to compromise and to de-elevate the greatness of our Lord. It's like, no, 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 don't listen to the false teachers. Look how great and look how above all else that Jesus is. And now here, Paul continues to point the Colossian church and us today to the glorious truth, the glorious hope, and the glorious, amazing gospel of Jesus Christ. It actually goes back to the beginning of the letter, verses 5 and 6, where Paul says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. So today we're going to see how the supremacy of Jesus Christ and and the hope of the gospel leads to three realities for the believer. And the first reality is this, who you were. To understand the glorious truth of the gospel, you have to first understand who you were. Look at verse 21. And, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil, deeds. I don't know if you ever read a passage or read a verse or or read anything, period. Well, I I know you read, I'm just saying. Whenever you read something, like, every single word can make a difference. Like, it it could be words that you may miss, and and when you read it, but but without it, everything would be different, right? And, And there's a few words in this passage where without them, it completely changes the meaning. And anyone want to guess which word that would be in this verse? you were. I'll even throw in the word although too, but all of this may have been true. This was true of you in the past. You were 
this. Not you are this. You were this. You were alienated. You were hostile in mind. You were engaged in evil deeds, etc. That was true of you, which indicates that it's not a reality anymore through Jesus Christ. That's glorious, friends, but we're, we're going to see more of that shortly, so, so hang, hang on on that. But in this passage as a whole, there's a literary device structure that Paul uses, and, and for us as believers today, we may not love grammar. Um, if you're a nerd, um, like, like some people are, um, you may love grammar. Um, but this is a grammar device that we should all love. You were this, but now you are this. So now go and do this. And that's going to be how our passage lays out this morning. But we know the church there, the Colossian church, it was a predominantly Gentile church. I mean, it was a newer church, uh, Old Testament church. And it's important because they weren't the ones that received God's law in the Old Testament. That was the people of Israel. In fact, up into the early church and and, and until Christ comes, the Gentiles weren't highly thought of at all, and it would often, they would be the ones described to show like they're the ones who are breaking God's law in morally reprehensible ways. And that doesn't mean that Israel was any less sinful than the Gentiles. We, We know God's word describes that they were just as bad off in their own way. But contextually, it's important to know that what they're hearing is super impactful. Imagine hearing this if you're a Gentile church, if, if you're hearing like, you were all of this, like look at all the things that you were engaged in, look at all that you were doing, all, all of what was true of you. Um, but now friends, now brothers and sisters, now church, here's the glorious news that that's not you anymore. Your old life, yeah, it was bad. It was bad, bad. That is no longer the case. See, the pre-conversion picture of the Colossians, and and now for any believer, it's quite shocking, and it's quite telling. We're kind of like this cup of water right here. It may be hard for you to see it, but when you get water out of a sink and you put it in a clear cup, you can see some nasty stuff that's kind of like, you know, floating at the top, that's unfiltered. Um, Seriously, like, you, you you can see it. Outwardly, it looks decent enough, right? I mean, it looks like a normal cup of water, something that you can taste and it be refreshing. But what you don't see is the different chemicals that are in here, the things present that make things like what should be a refreshing cup of water um, pretty nasty, if you only know. But if you pour it into a nice little filter here and let it filter through, this nasty cup of water with all the chemicals, it it filters through into a nice, refreshing, filtered, not cup, but drinkable water. I mean, we see this all the time in filtration systems, right? That's why we put filtered water systems. That's why we have Brita's at home or, or something that filters water so that when we drink it, it becomes drinkable. On the other side, you get this purified water, right? All those nasty chemicals, all that other stuff, it's been filtered out. It it was nasty water, and now it's been transformed into drinkable water. How much more so is this true spiritually? Right, this is just a cup of water, right? This is a a small example, but um, the work of God the transformation that he does, that's what's truly miraculous. Well, how so? Well, you got to look deeper into what the old self truly was like. See, prior to God, we're like the nasty cup of water with all the chemicals that may look okay outwardly, but inwardly it's, it's dead, it's sinful, it's wicked, it's corrupt. And without God's transformation, without Jesus Christ, we remain that way, but through his transformation, through Jesus Christ, we are purified. Sin and depravity, alienating somebody from God, is obviously very common. You just need to take a quick glance at probably really anywhere in the Old Testament to see this. If you go back to the Old Testament, specifically an example from Ezekiel 14, we're told to, we're told, talking about in the context of God's people, in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me, 
through their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all of your abominations. See, our hearts turn away from God because of our sin, in this case, idolatry, and we become alienated. We become estranged from our Lord. See, other words, synonyms for alienated are estranged, unfriendly. When you're estranged and alienated from God, you're unfriendly towards him. Antagonistic. You're set opposed to the Lord. I think we can all think of a human relationship that we probably had that could be described in those ways, and, and if you don't, praise the Lord for that, but, but everyone can think of an estranged or an unfriendly, maybe even antagonistic or a real relationship that's alienated, and it, it, is it comfortable? Does anybody want those types of relationships? They're uncomfortable, right? And once you are in those situations, how do you get out of them? Do estranged couples suddenly miraculously just turn it around? Do they suddenly just reverse the dynamic of their relationship? Or does something incredible have to happen? And if something incredible does happen, everyone notices, why? Because it's monumental. Because everyone knows what it was like before. And then that estranged couple who reconciles, it's like, well, praise the Lord. That's completely different than what they were before. Everyone sees that. And in those instances of alienation, that's never where we want to be in life. And it certainly is not where we want to be with God. The word for alienated appears only here in Colossians and in Ephesians in the New Testament, and it's a special word used by Paul to illustrate a greater truth. And, and let's look at the occurrences. We see it in Colossians, but let's look at the Ephesians occurrences. Ephesians 2.12 Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Separate, excluded, in context of being with the Lord. Ephesians 4.18 says, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. See, every usage implies not being a part of the life and not being a part of being in relationship with the Lord. Does anybody here, wanna, does anybody here want that? Or, or do you want to be in right relationship with the Lord? Well, praise the Lord if you've accepted Jesus Christ. You, you, that transformation can and, and is taking place, but um, that's not true for those apart from the Lord. Um, when Pastor Aaron preached through Galatians, he had a message entitled, The Enemy Within. And this was over Galatians 5, 17 through 21, but in that message, it, the flesh, the worldly flesh, your sinful flesh, it's against the things of God. It's literally hostile to him. It is an enemy, and this was all of us. Right, Romans three twenty three: for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You, prior to Christ, that was you, you have sinned, you fell short of God's glory, you were hostile to him, that's the way you were living, but for Christ. Paul also tells us in Romans 8, 7, that the mind set on the flesh, it's hostile towards God because it does not subject itself to God, and here's the kicker, it isn't even able to do so. That's just the striking indictment, and that's the striking reality of life apart from Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, that's just who you were. Or if you're listening this morning and you don't know Jesus, that's who you are. The Bible describes that as being an enemy of God, as being hostile to him. Our sin alienated us. Our minds were set against him. And this led to us engaging in evil deeds. See, heart, mind, action. The CSB translates the end of Colossians 1.21. This was all expressed in your evil actions. Meaning, what's already in your heart, what was already in your mind, that just expressed itself through the way that you live. The actions were just the end result. It had already started well prior to that. 
Your life was literally evidence of your alienation. It was literally the evidence of your rebellion against the holy God. The NIV references our behavior expressed as well. It's just a culmination of what's up in here. It's a culmination of what's in here. But I suspect, or better yet, I know this wouldn't be so popular to go around telling people today. I mean, if you walked up to somebody who that's, you know is far from Christ and say, hey, how are you doing today? Good. Well, guess what? I got something to tell you. You're an enemy of God. I mean, we laugh, but these things are all the time considered unloving and unkind, and you may even be labeled a bigot because you're engaging in hate speech. The irony is it just serves as another reminder of what Paul says, that the world is hostile to God because of its idolatry and because of its love of self. And any message, even if it's the truth, because this is the truth, that goes against that, and people don't like when you affront their way of life, if they're apart from God. They're some of us, we could be sitting here this morning and be like, you know what, I don't like being told that I, I was an enemy of God. I don't like being told that those who I love, those who I know, who are far from Christ, that they're an enemy of God. But it just further highlights the battle between the truth of God and the hostility towards that. But here's the thing. The, the scope of just how bad off we were, it makes the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, so much sweeter. That's the second reality, what Christ has done. The first was who you were, but you aren't that anymore. Why is that? It's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. If you go down to verse 22, Yet he has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Praise God, amen. Through his death, Christ has reconciled us to himself. See, all that, that was true about you. You were alienated from him. You were far from him. But Jesus Christ, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. See, this Greek word for reconcile appears 11 times in the New Testament. And what's notable about it is that nine times of those 11 usages, it is used in conjunction in some way with the cross, or with Jesus' death. All of that to say that reconciliation to God is not, was not possible apart from what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. See, Christ has died on that cross so that you can be reconciled to God, so that I can be reconciled to God. And this verse has two phases referencing reconciliation. The first is the means. Christ has died, right? That was the means in order to reconcile us to God. But the second is the purpose. It's so that he can present us holy and blameless and beyond reproach like we talk about in communion all the time, and and we just did Friday night as well. So Christ has died for you. And through that, and putting your faith and trust in him, you can be reconciled to God, but that is not where God is done with you. He's working in you now in order for that day to present you in this way. The word holy means to be set apart. This is what the Lord calls his people to be. We are to be set apart from the world, set apart from sin. The church is called to be this in 1 Peter 1, and this is referencing what God says back in the Old Testament. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Like the God who calls us, we are called to be set apart. But what happened? Well, the things previously seen in verse 21 happened, right? Sin, wickedness, depravity. It it created this seismic divide between us and God's holiness that the only one who could bring us back to God was Jesus Christ. Earlier we referenced a marriage where 
if a couple's estranged or apart, what's the term used if and when they get back together? Reconciled. Spiritually, we can only be reconciled through Jesus Christ, and once we are, it is glorious. He presents us before the throne as holy because only he can do that because he was the only one who could pay the price. He also prevents presents us as blameless and beyond reproach, meaning no one can look on God's people and say, you're condemned for what you did. You're at fault for what you did. See, are we still sinners? Yes, we are. But the reason we aren't condemned, the reason no one can find fault, the reason we are justified is because of Jesus, and in God's eyes, we are justified. We are not condemned. See, Paul's not merely speaking about personal conduct here. The reality is he's speaking to something greater. He's speaking to our position in Christ. Obviously, we're, gonna, we're still going to have times where we sin, this side of glory. But positionally in Christ, we are justified. We do not stand condemned. We are those things because of what Christ has done. So when Satan, when the enemy tries to tell you that your sin is too great or that your failure is too final, when it's too much, know this. God says, I have already paid for that. Yes, you were that but I sent my son to pay that penalty, to justify you in my sight, to sanctify you, to glory, and to look how I'm going to present you before my throne in that day. Amen. Now go and serve me. Don't listen to the enemy. Don't listen to this world. If you're holy and blameless in my sight, if you're justified in my sight, who cares what the world says? Amen. Who cares what the enemy says? He is defeated. Don't you live defeated. Live victoriously because God says you are. See, Christ's death on the cross had a purpose, and the purpose wasn't so that we would keep living on in our sin and being indifferent and cold towards him, as Pastor Aaron talked about in Hear Jesus. The reason was so that he could present his children as spotless, so that he could bring us back to himself. So given the penalty that the Lord had to pay and what and how he wants to present those that are his, why would we go on sinning? Why would we really go on doing anything else but serving him, loving him with passion, with excitement, with fire? Why would we ever be complacent and apathetic towards him? If you are his, look at how he wants to present you. And I think the reason that Paul is so blunt and straightforward about this is because there were attacks on this from all over, especially in the Colossian church. I mean, imagine talking about all this and, and knowing the truth of the gospel and, and, and people try to come in and attack it. See, remember that there was false teaching existent that specifically targeted the person of Jesus Christ. There was a watering down of the significance of Jesus' humanity, but here Paul is saying that through the physical death of Jesus— which is only possible if he is a human, if he was human. Through his physical death, you can be reconciled to God. Try and water that down. But today, there's still watering down teaching of Jesus. False teaching that's targeting the person of Christ. Presenting Jesus as a picture of a soft Jesus, one that is tolerant of people's sin in the name of love. a church that is so compromised on the teaching of the Word of God that we saw in the Hear Jesus series. Yes, Jesus loves you, but hear this. His love for you took him to the cross. His love for you bled out to pay for your penalty. Amen. My penalty. So yeah, is Jesus love? Does he love people? Yes, he does. This was the extent that he showed it. It's not so people could continue on in their sin. It's not so people could continue on living however they want. It's so that they could realize that their freedom, their very life, was bought with a price. Amen. His love for you is to save you and to call you to a transformed, greater life. And out of our love for him, we should have the heart and the conviction to do so and to be just that. See, he is the only one who can do this type of miraculous work. 
The deeds were evil on our part. Sin is horrific. Sin is pervasive in the sight of a holy God. But check out what Paul says in Titus 3, 5 through 7. He, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. That's all Jesus, only Jesus. Aren't you thankful this morning that he did that? Amen. And guess what? It, we can keep it a secret in here. Actually, don't keep it a secret. Go tell somebody about this. He, he is still doing that. Amen. God's still working. He's still saving people. He's still transforming lives. We just sang about that. He is still the way maker. If you look again to Colossians 1.22, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, this is language of not just now, but the future as well. Ephesians 5 uses similar languages, and they are verses we reference often at communion, but it says that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or any wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. See, he will do it. He will do it. You know, Pastor Aaron, you know, he, he gives those gold nuggets, you know, like in the text, when you see it in the text, and, and you may not explicitly see it, but it, it gets pulled out. We'll, we'll check this one out for you. Here's one. When holy and blameless are used together in the New Testament to point to Jesus' presentation of the believer, saying that you'll be holy and blameless, it's with the future in mind. This happens a couple times in Ephesians as well as Colossians. Yes, we are positionally, we are justified now in his sight, and we do not stand condemned. But one day, our holy status will become a holy reality in eternity, not just a positional thing in the here and now. See, in that day, we're actually going to be holy in his presence. In his book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, author and pastor Paul David Tripp says the following, when Christ died, I died. When Christ rose, I rose to a new life. Because I am united with Christ in his death and resurrection, the mastery of sin over me has been broken. Amen. Don't you love that? Because Christ, because of his death, because of his resurrection, that mastery that sin has over you, it's been broken. Once you put your faith and your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, that mastery has been broken. You have a new master now. And he is the one worthy to be served. That's the second reality, what Christ has done. Follow the first reality of who you were. Lastly, this morning, we see what you should do. Colossians 1.23, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister of here, minister of. See, there's a picture of turning here, right? You were this. You were over here. You were alienated from God. You were very far from him. Christ has come. Now go do this. Live like this. Don't, don't, don't return over here. Don't live like you're still over here. Live on this side of the cross. On this side. What Jesus would have you do. There's a right response to things, and there's always a wrong response, right? I mean, if you're presented with an option, there's a right one, and then there's a wrong one. In the real world, if you got this grand and awesome gift from somebody, say it's for a birthday or for an anniversary, um, happy anniversary, Rachel and Hayden, Heaven, by the way, I don't think they're here, but happy anniversary to them. If you got this grand and awesome gift from somebody, or from a relative, or a close friend, or a spouse, or whatever the case may be, Hopefully, your response would be one of great gratitude, right? 
And for the majority of people, hopefully your response would be ongoing. You would remember that and you would keep showing them gratitude and not six months down the line be ungrateful towards them again and, and, and not even remember the great and awesome thing that they gave to you and gifted to you. See, it's not just a, about being grateful in the moment. It's about wanting to continue to show kindness and love towards that person in, in response for this awesome gesture. See, we understand decency in response in real life. We understand what it means to show gratitude to people, how to respond well to people, how we treat one another, how we would treat a friend, and how we would treat those closest to us and, and all these things. Well, how much more should this be the case in how we respond to Jesus? See, Paul's wording is very intentional here. The word if introduces a condition that Paul assumed was true to reality for the sake of the argument, right? Since this is true, like if this is true, and it's rhetorical because it is, since this is true, now go and do this. Paul assumed his readers would do what he is describing because perseverance is normal for genuine believers. Godly response is normal for genuine believers. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. This is true. If you're reconciled, if you're transformed, you're brand new. Don't live like you're still over here. Amen. If you went out and bought a new car tomorrow, you wouldn't still be driving around your old beater. Amen. Well, I mean, well, it just depends. I mean, it depends on if you want to get a scratch on it or not, right? No, but anyway, I'm saying like, now the news come. The old's gone. Amen. We saw in the Here Jesus series that the church at Smyrna was told to be faithful unto death. Philadelphia kept his word and did not deny his name. And they both received only commendation because they were genuine. This should be the normal response of all believers, being faithful up until death, keeping his word, not denying his name, persevering. You are saved once and for all. This is true. So with that being reality, the words like faithful and firmly established and steadfast, not moving away from the hope of the gospel, all these things that Paul tells the Colossians, that should be the way that we are described. Amen. You see, Grace, do you want, not just in your life, but, but our church here to be described in, with those terms? Amen. We want to consistently abide in faith to the Lord. The warning, though, is this. While expected biblically, perseverance is not inevitable for a believer or for somebody claiming to know Christ without actually knowing him. See, things like apostasy, very real possibility, or lukewarmness if somebody isn't completely tapped into the Lord, to the Spirit, to the Word. See, if you or somebody isn't firmly rooted and firmly established, right, all the things that Paul talks about, there will be a lukewarmness. Even if you claim to know Christ, there could be apathy. There could be a lukewarmness because you're not tapped into him. You're not on fire for him. You're not responding appropriately and correctly to him. We want to continually respond well to the Lord. Do you want that? Amen, Amen we do. Amen. I know I do. And here's the truth that Paul knew and the truth that we should be encouraged with today. See, through Jesus Christ and in your faith in him, you are already firmly rooted and firmly established. And this should lead to walking with him. This should lead to overflowing with gratitude. That's what Paul says in Colossians 2. All of these things should be true. Like, you're, you're firmly rooted in him. Like, you're, it's like, in a good way, having concrete blocks around your feet. Like, you're firmly rooted. You aren't going anywhere. You're his. See, all of this carries with the idea of not being easily swayed. It, it means it, it doesn't matter what happens around you. It doesn't even matter what happens to you. You are not moving off of your walk with Christ and off of the gospel. And I know it's easy to say. I know it's easy to stand up here and say. I know it's easy to sit and, and hear this and be like, yeah, absolutely. But I, the world happens, right? The tension of I know, I know I need to please the Lord. I know this is what God would have me do, but you just don't understand. Like, it, if my boss catches wind of my faith in Jesus or if I, if I 
talk to my coworkers about him, like he's not going to be happy, and, and that could threaten my very livelihood. But you're firmly rooted. You're firmly established. God's right there with you. See, this is the place to be as Christians as a church, right? If you take a tree, for example, um, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong after this, but um, I don't know a whole lot about trees, but I know trees are rooted, right? They've got roots down deep. And I know tree roots anchor the tree in the soil and it it keeps the tree straight and stable. I mean, I don't know what would happen to a tree if it wasn't rooted, uh, not anything good. The roots also absorb water, right, and other nutrients and other chemicals out of the soil to produce what the trees need for growth, for development, for correction. So being firmly established means that the tree is so firmly established that it gets everything it needs through its roots, through how it is established, through how it's laid, or how it's in the ground. So being firmly established in your faith and and rooted, as Colossians 2 talks about, means that you are so rooted and so firmly established in Christ that your life could not possibly be the same apart from him. You're like there, you're like inseparable from Jesus. Would anyone describe you as being inseparable from your Lord? That everything you do revolves around pleasing him and worshiping him? In the statement of not moved away from the hope of the gospel, not, not being able to move off of that, it's notable because the Lycus Valley region where the Colossian church was located, the, their very context of their day, that region was known for its earthquakes and its ge- geographical instability. So it reminded the Colossians that when we say you're firmly established and that you are not to move away from the hope of the gospel, that, that, that's where you stay, that's where you live, that's where you are. It reminds them of just how secure they are in Christ and the security of Christ that that brings. For sure, the world around you, it may shake, it may quake, but you know what never will? The foundation you have in Christ, the gospel. That's not going anywhere. He is not going anywhere. The world will change. The world will progressively get more corrupt. It will get more wicked. It will get more depraved. In Grace Intercessors this morning, we're talking about even the confusion when it comes to things like gender and everything you see in the world today. All of that will keep changing. All of that will keep getting progressively worse. But the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, the life that it brings, how it's only his name that you can be saved, and only through him can you be transformed. That is as secure and firm as you will ever find in this life and in eternity. Amen. So the foundation you have in Christ, right? The gospel. Paul is explaining to the Colossians that now the gospel, this, it's gone all over. It's not just you hearing this. It's had widespread circulation and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. See, the false teachers, then and now, in their compromise, in their false teaching, it it may seemingly have an effective scope, right? People buying into it, people willing to compromise, but its scope is ultimately limited. Compared to the gospel, The gospel of Jesus Christ, that is bigger, that is more widespread, that is more powerful than anything else. Why? Because Jesus said it would be. See, Matthew 28, the Great Commission is to go to what? All nations. There's the scope. Acts 1.8 says to what? To the ends of the earth. There's the scope. Here in Colossians, proclaimed in all creation, there's the scope of the gospel. So whatever compromise, like limited compromise or false teaching you may hear, while bad, no, you know what? If I share the gospel, if I proclaim Jesus, if I proclaim the truth of his word, that false teaching will be squashed by the truth of God's word in the gospel. And obviously we know today that there, there are nations, there are people, groups that have not heard the gospel. What we can say for sure, though, is that wherever the gospel goes out to, it it bears incredible fruit. 
meaning the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is a force that no matter how hard the enemy, no matter how hard the world tries, it will not be stopped. They can't stop Jesus. That they're going to, in their futility, the world and their hostility, futility, they're going to try. But isn't it something that if you read stats of where the church is growing the most in the world today, it's under intense persecution? You ever hear stories from our brothers and sisters in Africa? Pastor Simon. Now, Uganda may not have a um, specifically like, hey, we're going to throw you in jail for sharing the gospel, but, but there's a lot of Muslims in their nation. There is a lot of opposition to the gospel, and they don't have the material things that we have here, but people are like, you know what? I want Christ. I want this Jesus. This is what I want to believe in. We see this in our brothers and sisters in India. Under intense, incredible persecution, Church is still growing, gospel's still going out. China, underground church. Many, many nations where it's outlawed to be a Christian, where they face the incredible persecution that we talk about, but they're actually experiencing, and they're still faithful, and they're still bold, they're going out. What about the early church? We're going through Acts in Sunday school now. We, we went through Acts as a church a few, few years back. Early church, incredible persecution, didn't matter. Proclaiming the name of Jesus, the gospel will not be stopped. See, Paul was a minister of this gospel, as he says at the end. And and this word for minister is uh, translated as, as servant here. Paul literally devoted his life to be a servant, to be a minister, to do everything he could through his response to the Lord to proclaim this, to be a servant of this. Paul's story... And Paul's story we know was, I was this. Talk about evil deeds. I hunted down Christians. I hunted down believers and followers of Jesus. I don't think anybody here has ever done that. But then Christ happened. Now I am this. And his only response, and our only response, is to be servants, to be wholly sold out for the gospel for Jesus Christ. We need to alert ourselves to the fact that God is not only inviting you to to get in the game and play, but to play for the championship team, the GOAT team for my sports people, the greatest of all time team. What an invite. God's saying, be a part of this. Be a servant of this. See, you were this. I know you were this but I've redeemed you. You're not this anymore. And if you're still here today and this is still you, know that Jesus Christ has said, no, no, put your faith and trust in me. I have paid the penalty for that. You don't have to be that anymore. You don't have to be an enemy of God. You can be a servant of God. What an invite. Don't sit on the sidelines with a shaky faith or with no faith at all. But be confident in who Christ says you are. Be confident in what he's done for you, the transformation that he offers. You aren't that anymore. So the three, three realities, who you were, what Christ has done, what you should do. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. There's a reason that this is called the great news, the the good news, the great news, the best news ever. See, when I think of Paul's words of continuing in the faith and not moving away from the gospel, it reminds me of the old adage, and maybe you've heard this before, when the unstoppable force meets an immovable object. And that old adage is is described when, you know, when two things, like the, the, the unstoppable force and the object that can't be moved, when they collide, like who would win and all this stuff, and and I'm sure we all heard it, and equal but opposite forces collide, and our takeaways this morning are going to come from this adage and our application, and we're going to flip this on its head, all right? We're not going to put these opposed to one another. In fact, we're going to combine these. And the first takeaway is this, be an unstoppable force for the gospel. 
Paul says, do not move away from this. He literally gave his transformed, redeemed life and service to this gospel. See, that's how Paul reminded or responded to the incredible transformation that Jesus brings. See, you were this. Remember, you were that. Then Christ, now do this. Be this unstoppable force. See, the gospel's going out regardless, right? But if you are a willing participant in that, in obedience to the Lord and in the transformed life and what he's doing in you, see, you can be a part of the unstoppable force of the gospel. In fact, you could be the one where people say, man, they just will not stop proclaiming the name of Jesus. I want that to be described about me, do you? Paul was an unstoppable force through the Holy Spirit, of course. Believer, friend, brothers and sisters, today you can be an unstoppable force for sharing the gospel. See, not moving off the gospel. That's what I think when I think you're not moving off the gospel. You're literally, this is the gospel, like I'm here, I am devoted, I am sold out for this. I can do nothing but preach this. Amen. See, either way, God's going to do something. He's going to move. The gospel is the real unstoppable force. You're just along for the ride of sharing it and being about it every single day, and what a ride. Everyone keeps saying, hey, let's go to King's Island. Let's go to King's Island. And I'm like, well, there's no ride at King's Island that's going to top being a part of this unstoppable force. See, the awesome, awesome reality for you and for me is that God not only invites us to be reconciled to him through Jesus, but also to be the agents through which his message goes out in the world today. Only a holy, awesome God, only a great God like we sang about earlier, can take somebody who was this over here, who was alienated, who was hostile, who was estranged. Only he can reconcile that person to himself and say, not only am I going to do that, I'm going to do this. I'm going to reconcile you. I'm going to justify you, but I'm going to redeem you. I'm also going to use you. How wonderful. How wonderful. And responding to this invitation turns you from an enemy to an ally, to a friend of God. So let me ask, do you truly see yourself as a servant of God, of the gospel, someone who is going to do whatever it takes to do what God wants them to do. Pray for the willingness to be that if you aren't. Why would we want to sit on the sidelines? Why would we not want to be a part of this? Who are you going to share with this week? When are we going to be able to fill up our kingdom wall and be known as the unstoppable gospel-sharing church at EC Grace? Are we going to be like what we saw in Sunday school, like Peter and John, who being questioned by the Sanhedrin, couldn't help but speak the name of Jesus? Like, I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you command me to do. God's commanded me to do this, and and, uh, do your best, but I'm going to do this. Unstoppable. And the second takeaway, let your faith be an immovable object in this world. See, Paul says, be steadfast, firmly rooted, firmly established. Don't move. You are a new new creature following the creator, the Lord, your Savior, the King of kings, the defeater of death. What could possibly strike fear in us that Christ hasn't overcome? See, Paul uses terms like firmly established, steadfast, to describe the faith of a redeemed person. That's strong imagery. Colossians 2, like we already said, he uses rooted to describe something similar. See, through Jesus, you have a new identity, a transformed one that is built on the bedrock of his blood, that's built on the bedrock of his resurrection. See, there is nothing in the world, nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate you from that. There's nothing that could come in the way of that. So why would we not persevere and have this type of immovable faith, a faith that says, you know what, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I know the world can throw some pretty intimidating things and some pretty fearful things, and there are many people that are living in that, but it doesn't matter. It does not matter because Jesus has overcome that, and let me tell you about my Lord. 
Friends, nothing is going to be able or should be able to move you off of your faith, off of the confidence that comes through Jesus Christ. It's the two, in the two commendations that Jesus gives to the churches from here, Jesus, with no rebuke. Listen to what he tells them in Smyrna. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Revelation 2.10. Jesus knows what his people will go through. If he knows what, they're, what they'll go through and he still promises you and assures you and tells you to have confidence, can you have confidence? He knows. And there will be a reward for those who have an immovable faith. And what's he tell to Philadelphia? Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Revelation 3a, he then goes on to commend them for how they have kept his word, how they have not denied his name, how they kept the word of his perseverance before a final charge to continue to overcome. See, yes, God's going to work through you. God can and will. He, he will work through you. He, you. You can do big things for God if you persevere, if you have a faith that's unshakable. See, that's what an immovable faith looks like. I mean, when Jesus tells Smyrna, Don't, do not fear in, in Philadelphia, um, look, continue to persevere, continue to press on. I mean, do you not think that they didn't have forces or things going against them that would be fearful if we were facing the same today? But through their immovable faith, through their choice to respond to the Lord, to be obedient to him, to persevere, these two churches get commended. When other churches would compromise or sink into immorality or continue to be apathetic and lukewarm, they get commended for their faith. That's what Paul is encouraging the Colossians to have because what is the danger? Not being an unstoppable force for the gospel and not having an immovable faith. Not being those things. The last church in Revelation that we saw in the Hear Jesus series was Laodicea. And we know that they had a problem because they were lukewarm and the Lord wanted to vomit them out of his mouth. No one is going to say that that church was the epitome of being an unstoppable force for the gospel and for having a strong, steadfast, immovable faith. They're not going to get mistaken for that. So here's why it's important for us today to heed Paul's words. Colossians was written many years prior to what we saw in Revelation with Laodicea about 30 or so years before, to be exact. We know that Laodicea was a neighboring church to Colossae. Geographically, it was, there is a similar distance of that from E.C. Grace to downtown Indianapolis, away from one another. It was close. I mean, they were neighbors. Some people here commute farther than that to get here every, every Sunday. Look how Paul ends Colossians, the beginning of 4.16. So everything he said that we saw last week and this week and everything else in Colossians, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. So remember, everything that Paul's saying here is 30 years before the rebuke of Jesus, the rebuke of the Lord to the Laodicean church. All of this, all of the things that we've seen about the supremacy of Jesus and his transformation and, and all of how great he is and the transformation that he does and, and what you should do as a response at some point ceased to be the main priority for the Laodiceans as we know. Laodiceans, as we know. Somehow that hearing about the supremacy of Jesus that Paul tells the Colossians that should have been read in the Laodicean church and, and was and, and all of these things still didn't strike. It wasn't heeded. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let the words of the Lord, the words of his word, not be heeded. Take what you know about the supremacy of Jesus, how he transforms, how great he is, and, and yet Jesus, and all of these things, and, and use that as fuel, as motivation, like, Lord, I want that. I want you to use me. And it's not me and my own strength, my own righteousness, my own power, but it's what you're doing through me. Amen. Only you, Jesus, only you. Continuously remind yourself and say, I was this. 
yet Jesus. Yet Jesus. Amen? You were this. You were this. You were that nasty cup of water. But you are no longer that. You are transformed, being used by God, be an unstoppable force for the gospel, be immovable in your faith. And, and, and just, you know, as the praise team comes up, as we get set to close, just look at the warning. I mean, the Laodicean church, they, they would have heard this message from Colossians. They didn't heed the words. And, and now the Lord wanted to spit them out of his mouth because they were so lukewarm, because they were so apathetic. They weren't on fire. And I think of the only right response to Jesus, it, it's true, it's to be on fire. And when you see the words of Paul in Colossians, why would you want to be anything else? but wholly sold out for him, allowing Christ to work in you and through you. Amen. Lord, we just praise you for your word. Lord, we praise you that who we were was an enemy to you, Lord, was hostile to you. But Jesus, Lord, you came, you died. Lord, you paid the penalty for our sin. Lord, you rose again, you defeated death, you have overcome everything, Lord, and you've transformed us, and you say, Now do this, let me use you. Lord, we we wanna respond to you, we wanna respond to who you are, we wanna respond to what you've done for us, Lord. And and Lord, I pray um, for all of our brothers and sisters this morning that that's how we respond, Lord. And if there's anybody listening, that's still them, that they're still the, the, the old self living in the flesh, Lord, hostile to you that today will be the day that they say, Lord, I do not want to be your enemy any longer. I want to be your child. I want to be yours, and I want to be used by you. May that be, today be the day where that becomes true. Lord, we ask all of this in your name this morning. Amen.